thank you uh, all for, for joining us today at the studio. Um, this next session is on machine intelligence and the future of society. <laughs> If you didn't catch me earlier, I'm Doug Drinkwater. I'm the editorial and strategy director here at Hot Topics. And uh, joined by a really experienced panel here, different job titles, different, different industries. So we have Stuart Bibble, who is the Chief Data and Information Officer at EasyJet. Quay Tran, who is a Regional CIO and Head of IT for Europe at DP World. Lauren Sager Weinstein, who is the Chief Data Officer at TFL, uh, and last but by no means least, Gail McFarlane, who is a partner at Eversheds Sutherland. Um, oh, sorry, I've missed Alan Cockwell. Alan, uh, apologies. Uh, we have Alan Cockwell, who holds the dual responsibility of CIO and CISO at Shell. So, Alan, thanks for joining us today. Now, you might all have in your head visions of Skynet in Terminator, or perhaps Tom Cruise in Minority Report. Maybe it's Will Smith. Uh, in iRobot. I want to start, and I'm going to come to you, Stuart, if you're in my immediate line of sight. We get, I think already at the studio, we've explored how we get very excited by new technologies. Um, how much of the caution around these technologies is necessary? How much of the hype is, is reality? And how much of it is, is simply that is actually hype? So I think that there is caution. Um, and I have a, I'm a general optimist, um, and you, what you read in the Daily Mail, etc., about doom and gloom, about intelligence, AI, Gen AI is going to, it is going to change. It is going to change how we work, how we live, the tools, etc. Quay, I want to come to you on that because I guess it's human nature in a way, in a way, isn't it, that we knew. Yeah, you know, I think when telephones came in, when the printing press came in go back far enough, I think Socrates are talking about writing being a discipline to be feared. So, I mean, human nature in many ways does this with, with, with new introductions to society. So, what, what's your view on how much of it is that caution is, is necessary? Yeah, I think, I think as, 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 as humans generally, I think we, we, we like stability and consistency. And obviously, with new emerging technologies in particular, there's a, there's a huge unknown which causes uncertainty and, and us to react in certain ways. Uh, you look at certain technologies over time, I think we've kind of bundled them, and I think AI in the same bracket, which is, is it a replacing technology, as in it's going to replace my role, my job, my industry, or is it an enabling or complementary technology, as in it's going to help me do my job better or enhance the industry or grow it forward and so forth. So you, know, you look at things like the printing press, and I mean, it, it, it enabled sort of reading to the masses and education and so forth, you know, exponentially. But obviously at the time, you know, it, 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 it replaced a load of traditional work. So sometimes it can be replacing, but actually the actual enablement it creates could be so much more greater. We're in a tech room, um, a tech forum, and people who love technology, and of course I love data, I get very excited about it. Um, but of course, we need to sort of think broader about what are the problems that we're trying to solve. And I think that's exactly right that we're saying that this is like, this is really exciting, um, but we have to really be focused on what specific problem, how we're going to make people's lives easier, what will change for them to make things easier, what might not. Um, and I think that's the sort of the focus that would be helpful for us to take. Alan, coming, coming to you, uh, interesting okay. dual responsibilities in, in CIO and CISO. First of all, I'm assuming you have many arguments with yourself, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the kind of the, the trigger moment? I guess I think someone on the prep call we had before this referred to it as the iPhone moment with ChatGBT. I think someone else referred to it as the spreadsheet moment. Um, that's really brought it into a yeah, pub public consciousness, isn't it? it? It's kind of really brought it to the masses as, a pers as opposed to the few. Yeah, we're, we're in an age of the co-pilot. So the person who can use these tools will replace the person who doesn't use these tools. Yeah, I, I don't see a scenario in the near term where people are fully replaced, but again, the individuals that can figure out how to best use this technology to monetize it, to do their job better, uh, they will ultimately win out. From a cyber perspective, uh, we're seeing a weaponization of this technology today. And the reality is we're going to live in a world where cyber attacks are, are not linear. Uh, they don't uh, occur in sequence. It will be multifaceted, potentially, delivered in real time 
with an incredible amount of precision that historically we, we haven't seen. I think a lot of these conversations can be quite up and up in the air. So let's go to some actual use cases. I'm going to start again with you, Stuart. Um, I think I'm right in saying that you've got kind of out, you've been running NLP and chatbots for customer personalization. Um, I think it's something, in, and there's been at TFL, I think there's route planning efficiencies that you're using with these technologies. And I think it's a similar story for Quay at DP Well. Gail, I am going to come to you on the legal aspect. We've got a lot to cover. Stuart, first to you. What, how are you using these technologies today? Um, well, the, the, in JDI, we've got two solutions live. Uh, one is uh, uh, emails into the contact center. Customer email typically take 20, 25 minutes for someone to read it, understand it, compose a response, send a response. Um, put in uh, uh, Gen AI onto that and it summarizes email, composes a response, a proposed response, and gives it to uh, the, the, the agent. So you're now down to 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes rather than 20, 25. So that's the co-pilot solution. When you've got these models out there, this isn't a data problem now. This is an, just a traditional engineering problem to go and integrate it you then start facing into the, uh, the, the uh, data and the legal issues around that. And that, a, that was a significant discussion point we had on all of these before we went live. But they are now, in the space of three months, we've gone from zero to there, and we've got about another 11 in flight uh, that we're developing as we speak. I do want to come into that people element now, because I think there's a, a degree of obviously caution and concern ar around that with, with good cause in many ways. Um, Quay, you want to come to, to yourself? I think you mentioned about using even the code to kind of clean the data, travel routes being optimized. Just give us a kind of a minute summary of the kind of initiatives that you've spun up or working on. So obviously we use AI for, you know, optimization of our, our, our stacks, of our, our, our container ports, you know, predicting when, when, uh, when new uh, vessels arrived and so forth, just to optimize our equipment. And actually that helps the, uh, the, uh, the vessels as well. So, you know, global maritime, uh, you know, shipping, you know, the, uh, the, the largest percentage of the cost is actually in the fuel. So actually, so if you can actually predict when it should arrive, when it shouldn't arrive, actually, you can optimize actually the, the speed of which the vessel goes. And actually that optimizes hugely actually the fuel efficiency and actually saves both, you know, cost perspective and actually from an environmentally perspective as well. Um, we've done other things such as predicting next mode of transport and so forth. So that understanding where that cargo is going to go and optimizing that route uh, and so forth. Um, and also things like smart stacking. So, you know, in a traditional container terminal, you have, you know, containers stack on top of each other. So actually, if you need to take a container at the bottom out of six, then you move it using six moves, taking that container out, putting another six, 12 moves. That's unproductive, inefficient, costly, and so forth. So actually, you know, with AI and so forth, actually, if you're predicting, you know, what's the next box, the hot, hot box and so forth, then you can optimize your stacking and so forth. And actually, that becomes very, very powerful in how you actually, especially in the last few years, you've probably seen the, uh, the uh, you know the supply chain challenges and so forth that becomes hugely powerful and important. Any questions in the room? If not, I'm going to come to Gail next. Um, any questions? Yes, Paul. If we can get a microphone to Paul. Do you think governments or the EU or people should regulate um, generative AI? And if so, how? Well, we're getting ready for it in Europe. So actually, this week we're writing papers to to set up the guide rails how to appropriately use this technology. And, and we're doing this in advance of the AI Ethics Act, which we uh, expect to, to happen in the next couple of years. So I think there is going to be a focus on this to make sure that this technology isn't uh, uh, abused or misused. So I think there, there will be uh, that regulation happening in this space. And I think uh, we, you know, we've mentioned already you know, the, this evolution of technology, the printing press, the computer. We do find that at each point that there is that step change, there is a need for some form of... of uh, of control or, or limitation to that. Everybody, you know, here ha has great, you know, <laughs> intents in relation to their use of these technologies, but that doesn't mean that everybody in the world does. Um, and so, you know, w when we developed the printing press, you know, as we were talking about earlier, there suddenly started to be a need for defamation laws. You know, if you're going to be writing books that are going to, you know, be, be saying bad things about other people and promulgating those, uh, you know, that at an increased scale, it's not the same as somebody having a chat down the pub. Now, you know, AI I is, is, is that, you know, on steroids. How do you manage these things in a global manner? And that's what makes regulation so difficult. But it, it is about, it's, it's, not a t it's not the technology point. It doesn't, we don't need to regulate the technology. We're not specifically saying it's because it's this type of code. 
you know, what it is is this is a type of harm that can result from the scale that is facilitated by these types of activities. And so governments, you know, in looking at this in a technology neutral manner, can start to see, okay, well, how can we, how can we, we regulate it? And, you know, are there things that we just shouldn't allow people to do because even though there could be benefits, the, the downsides are so, so, you know, kind of um, significant. No, in terms of taking people with you, because I think that's quite a key element, isn't it? When we look at these technologies, a lot of jobs are, a lot of professions are genuinely at risk, including mine, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, how do you take people with you? There's a lot of fear mongering out there, not least actually. A lot of that fear mongering is done by, you look at OpenAI and Sam Altman, in one sentence he'll say that this is the next great tool for humanity, and the next sentence he'll say that we're all doomed. So. How do we? How do you, with your teams and across the wider organisation, bring people with you on that journey? This is a fundamental sort of problem about new technology coming in, and how do you make sure that it is seen as an as a helper um, with changes for some people, um, but not necessarily create the environment where you're feeling pitted against each other? Because it just isn't it isn't going to be successful for us. Um, so. You know, one of the things that we can do is really talk about the value, and this is why having conversations about just pure technology will get certain, as I said before, aspects of our teams really excited. But um, really thinking about the ver the things we can do, um, and in our case, you know, my teams, my colleagues are are here because we want to help connect London. We want London to move. So we all come from that. Uh, perspective of saying how can we help Londoners get to where they need to go how can we sort of build a city and a society so we have this shared goal and technology can help with that in terms <laughs> of responsibility there, cause I think there is a danger isn't there that a lot of this stuff gets almost cast upon teams top down and it actually isn't always the way that teams work so uh, whose responsibility is it and, and what's the, your advice for people in the room in terms of how to tackle that we have laws uh, and then you have you know ethics and they are different things, you know, compliance with the law is, is your bare minimum. Um, but, but in terms of then where you move um, beyond that, there's a difference if you're a public sector organization with a public duty, if you're a private sector organization with a duty towards your shareholders, you know, what you're looking at. But the important thing is to really um, have those conversations, have those strategic discussions. Don't just think I've got a problem, here's a solution. It's like, okay, what's the impact of that solution? Where does that go? What does that mean? Where are we going to go from there? We talked early in the earlier session on Gen AI, they were talking about and employees. They talked about, you know, kind of uh, I I good intentions, but, but, but unexpected, uh, uh, unforeseen, you know, kind of results. And you've got to actually try and foresee those results and see what the consequences are going to be. Stuart, your kind of one piece of advice to the audience, and I'll go to Alan and then to Quay. Um, it's probably two. One, don't be afraid of it, step into it. And two, take your people with you. Uh, name of the game is continuous learning. You know, this will be a, a technology among others that will help to disrupt. So individuals that are curious to figure out how to use it, to leverage it, to disintermediate themselves, to make themselves more effective, that will ultimately rule the day. So uh, be curious, continuously learn, and uh, experiment. Great. Yeah, um, two actually as well. So obviously I, I brought up the iPhone moment uh, on our call, because obviously it's 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 brought AI um, to the to the to the wider masses. Essentially, it's become you know from something that was hugely complicated with experts to actually something that's extremely powerful, simple, and usable. And I think that with that comes great opportunity, but also bigger risk, because obviously uh, with the wider community, you need to understand actually what it's really good at right now, what it's not so good at, and so forth. So I think you know I think they did something about you know it doing an MBA, being a B minus student, right? So, you know, you know it's B, B minus is very good in a lot of things we do in our organizations today. But there's certain things that we need to be A star, star like safety, you know, lives, all that kind of stuff. So it's just understanding the use cases for that. Lauren, over to you. And I'll be quick, uh, focus on the value. Brilliant, you get the gold star, over to you, Gail. <laughs> uh, uh, keep grounded in reality, it's not magic. Um, you know, it, it, isn't, it isn't intelligent depending on your definition. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, A, it's not going to solve all the problems you think it's going to solve. Um, but B, it needs, it needs a sense check. It, it, it needs a, a reality check at all times to, to keep, you keep grounded. Fantastic. Um, wonderful conversation. So many more questions. We've run out of time. But um, up next in Studio One is the uh, session on circular economy, and session uh, Studio Two is on multi-cloud. Um, there are also VIP tours going on this afternoon. If you want to see Abbey Road Studios, so do go to the desk 
at the back of Studio One to, to get on those. But for now, um, huge topic. Well done to all of you for covering. So please put your hands together for today's panel. Thank you.